Good day. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar um, for the Frisian horse. Uh, my name is uh, Bart Ducro and I'm working at the uh, Wageningen University in uh, Wageningen, the Netherlands, in the animal breeding and the genomics uh, group. Um, in my work, I'm dealing pretty much with um, breeding programs on, uh, on horses, optimizing that and selection for uh, health uh, traits. And today I'd like to uh, give a presentation on the inherited disorders in the Frisian uh, horse. Um, yeah, as you are looking and watching this, uh, this video, you're pretty much uh, involved in the Frisian horse and uh, you are fond of the breed because of its uh, fine character, its versatility and uh, um, its fine character also to that. And well, if you uh, are really fond of it, it might be that you also consider to, to start breeding with it. So if you have an, a mare and you want to um, produce a foal, you select an, uh, a very nice uh, stallion and you are really looking forward to the, the foal that is uh, produced by this uh, combination. Well, you can say it's really a nightmare if it ends up with a foal which is showing all kinds of genetic defects. So that is really um, not very nice. And maybe by that time you will ask yourself, how, how is this, uh, uh, what is the reason for this? How is this coming there? And what could I have avoided that? And why is it? more in the Frisian horse than in others, because I'm afraid that is the case as it is now, that uh, relative more of these genetic disorders are seen in the Frisian horse than in others. So, and that will be uh, the, the scene of my, uh, my talk, uh, to see what is the cause of that and, and how can we deal with uh, genetic uh, disorders in this way. Before I'll uh, uh, go into that uh, theory, I'd like to uh, introduce to you the, the influencers and who are the initiators on this type of uh, research. And that is, first of all, it is uh, uh, Wim Bak, uh, who used to work at the Utrecht University, the fac veterinary faculty over there. And as he, um, I think it is in the, in the 19th of the last century, he uh, uh, was confronted with these inherited uh, disorders and he himself he thought well let's start collect samples let's start to collect the genetic material for it and maybe by that time it was not possible really to do the analysis but he he was he had at least this uh, division and next to that I also uh, you probably know uh, it's Hellinga who used to work at uh, the Frisian uh, stud book. And he was also uh, thinking of, okay, once we have the uh, genetic background of these uh, diseases, how to integrate that in the breeding practices. Okay, so the contents of this uh, webinar, uh, first to, to understand what's going on um, with respect to the genetics, uh, I will give you a short introduction on the genetic uh, theory. And after that, I will look into the DNA tests that already have been uh, developed so far and the current work that is going on on, uh, on additional diseases. Um, and again, uh, in the end, after that, I will show, uh, talk a little bit about the uh, how to integrate that in the breeding programs, how can we select against these uh, disorders. First of all, it's um, good to, to start with the basics of inheritance of, uh, of genes. So we know that the, uh, the building plan and uh, the, the functioning of the body that is uh, laid down in the DNA, in, um, like you see uh, over here. And um, there are genes in this uh, <coughs> in the DNA that are uh, coding for uh, of uh, a couple of these uh, functionings uh, of the body and uh, and so on. And if we focus on one of these uh, genes, like you see here, a gene consists of two parts, <coughs> and uh, in the transmission of these uh, genetic material to the uh, uh, progeny, half of uh, the genetic material of each of the parents 
is transmitted to their progeny. So it could be that uh, here the, the red half of uh, one of the parents is transmitted here, uh, combined with the light blue half of the other parent and that's going on. So in this way, all these four combinations of the genes uh, can be transmitted, each with an equal chance of, of being transmitted. So it is a process of coincidence what is transmitted uh, to, the, to the progeny. Now suppose that we have the situation that there is a common ancestor somewhere in the pedigree of these uh, parents. So basically the parents are related and they have um, one of these uh, parts of the genes has been transmitted from this, this uh, ancestor to each of these uh, parents. And then this very same part of the gene that is transmitted to their uh, progeny, and you see that this uh, here in the second progeny, you see that the, the same gene has been uh, transmitted. Now suppose that we um, are dealing with an, uh, a bad allele, a bad uh, copy of this uh, gene that is uh, transmitted, and it is uh, coding for a uh, genetic uh, defect. And uh, in case that um, the genetic defect is only shown in the progeny when the, that progeny has both uh, the bad alleles on this one, then we can uh, expect that this particular progeny that is showing the, the defect. If that's the case, then we are dealing with recessive inheritance. And recessive inheritance that uh, uh, means that uh, the defect is only shown if both copies are uh, the bad ones in this case. So that means that in case that only one of these uh, bad alleles has been uh, transmitted, that the particular horse is not suffering from the bad allele and it is still healthy. So in this case, only if there are two copies here, then we see the affecting. And it might be that this particular horse is dying or is uh, suffering, is ill from it, whereas the others are not. If we are talking about recessive inheritance, then we say if an, a horse has only one bad copy on this uh, particular gene, then we call that a carrier meaning that it can transmit to its own progeny the, the bad allele. Um, so here we see two carriers in, uh, in this case, and we see one affected and we see one foal that is completely free of it and will not transmit the bad allele to the next generation. And most of the inherited disorders we are facing are recessive, uh, yeah, like you see here in this example. Um, we all have errors in our DNA. We all have bad genes in it. And as long as there is a good gene uh, opposite on it, there's no problem in it. So that is what, uh, uh, why you only see very rarely uh, these, these negative uh, uh, disorders. And on average, each of us has about 3% of the, of the genes being such a bad uh, copy. And you can compare it to having a very bad copier machine uh, that is making, producing errors each time you copy it and all those faults that are transmitted to the next uh, generation. So we pass on our bad alleles to the next generation. But as long as it is on, on a different gene uh, for each of us, then there is not a problem. So if we are mating, and it is also the same in the horses, with another, um, with, an, uh, with a mate that is not related to us, then very likely we have these errors on different genes. And then there is not a problem, there is no expression of the, of the disorders. But in case we are mating with a relative, and it's also in the horses of course, the relatives very have a higher uh, chance of having the same error on the same gene. 
and then you might have that the, the copies are coming together and that we have an expression of these uh, bad variants. Well, how is it going on in, in, a, in uh, normally in, uh, in our uh, horse stud books, in our breeds? Very often we have uh, a few very popular horses that we are using very intensive. And we allow those horses, by using so intensively in the population, we allow them to spread their the good genes, of course, in the population, but also these bad uh, genes. And also their sons and maybe their daughters, they're also disseminating the good genes, but also the bad genes throughout the population. So that means that there are relative many carriers of these bad genes in the population as well. And then it might be that after a few generations, we see that, the, uh, that there is some mating among the descendants, and then we see that the disorder is emerging. And then if the prevalence of these uh, disorders is at a certain level, uh, my experience is if it is about 5%, then people start talking about, hey, I've heard about this order also from that and that one, and also from that member, and so on. Then we, we, the, the, the signal of, of a uh, disorder going around in the, in the stud book is there. And then by that time we want to find out, okay, who's to blame for it? Where is the stallion that has causing this? But then we have to look back maybe four or five generations. That is a very hard task to, to figure out who is to blame for it. And maybe it's not so very relevant for the current breeding uh, either. So, uh, so uh, that, is, that is the practical setting, uh, what we often see in the different uh, stud books uh, if it comes to the uh, genetic disorders. But of course, we want to get rid of these uh, disorders. And how can we do that? How, what, what is the purpose or what is the, the, the goal in that, how uh, to do that? Well, the difficulty, the problem is that we cannot, from the outside, see on a healthy horse if it is a carrier of the disorder or not. Because the horse itself, it has only one of these bad alleles, is not suffering from it. So it, it looks very healthy. So therefore, we have to dive into the uh, DNA. We have to find the gene that is responsible for this um, uh, disorder, where, where the error is. Um, and, uh, well, maybe we could uh, develop an, a DNA test. And then at least by such a DNA test, we can identify, okay, this is a carrier. And if we, have, uh, we know this horse is a carrier, we shouldn't mate it with another carrier because then we have a risk of having a, uh, a diseased uh, foal produced by this, uh, by this mating. <coughs> okay, so we have to dive into the, to the genes and in the DNA. And how does that look like? Okay, well, what, what is the building, uh, the structure of, of DNA? Well, and um, DNA is uh, built up, uh, consists of, of uh, is actually distributed uh, in the horses on, on 64 chromosomes. Like you see here, this is a chromosome, uh, a chromosome pair, what you see here. And each of these chromosomes, there is um, the, the basic building block are these base pairs, which are chemical structures, which are denoted uh, by an A, a C, or a T, or a G. So these are four different types of chemical structures. Uh, and these are the basic building blocks of this, uh, of this DNA. And a certain string of it is, uh, builds up to, to uh, one of these genes. And in total, out of these three billion base pairs, just imagine three with, uh, billion, that's, that's a huge uh, length and there are, um, metaphors uh, telling you, well, how big is it? It is uh, an, a multiple sets of, of Winkler Prince encyclopedias you can fill with all these, uh, these letters. So it is very large. 
And there are 20,000 genes roughly on, uh, on that. And we don't know the exact fixture, uh, functions of each of these genes. We are learning, but we are not there that we really can uh, look on that uh, so specifically. So we, we have to, to find a way to enter these, these 3 billion base pairs and to see where are the differences that are responsible for the disorders we are interested in, in our traits. So <coughs> variation between individuals, gen genetic uh, variation, and that means that it is also transmitted to the next generation, therefore it is genetic variation, that must be uh, find back as variation in these base pair patterns that we uh, have here. But we <coughs> hardly, it is hardly possible, and it is maybe neither, it's really needed to really uh, sequence all of these base pairs to find out, okay, where are the differences? So we, we uh, <coughs> made use of a somewhat simplified uh, approach. And the, the entering of the genome, we use markers. And markers are indeed these, these base pairs. We look for difference between them. Uh, not each of them, but we took a summary, we took a sample of them, more or less evenly spaced uh, across the whole of the genome, where we see differences. And if we see differences, it is also reflecting that in that segment of the DNA, there is some kind of, of differences. And if it is associated with the trait we are interested in, then we can use these, uh, these flags. So we are looking at these single base pairs. If there is uh, uh, in the population we are looking, so there are differences be um, between the members, then we say, okay, this is a single nucleotide polymorphism. And we can use that to link, uh, to read out, to read that segment on the DNA for that. Therefore, we are using that. So here you see an, uh, another example. So we have here four individuals, and you see here this array of markers. And here at this specific point, we see there is a variation in these base pairs. So individual one is homozygous, GG. Individual three is also homozygous, but for the other one, AA, and individual two and four are uh, heterozygous. So there is difference on <coughs> Variation, there is variation on this uh, specific uh, base pair, so we can use that as a marker. And in this way, um, yeah, well, there are different uh, chips developed by where you see that uh, uh, 50,000 to 70,000 uh, different base pairs all along this DNA, DNA string has been. Um, uh, identified and to read out these different uh, markers along that has been uh, put down on these so-called um, SNP arrays. And uh, the ca these can be uh, used in the, um, <coughs> in the lab to be automatically read out and see what the status of these different markers are. And then to see if there are differences. So initially Illumina had these 50,000 and 70,000 and later on the company Avimetrix had even 650,000 uh, markers put on, on such a uh, SNP array. Well, and the procedure is that we look, we, uh, and, and that's also how we uh, have used it. So we have uh, <coughs> a group which is affected by the disease and we have uh, a group that is free of the disease, and we compare their DNA on these markers uh, using these type of, uh, of SNPs. And the, the typical figures that can be, uh, uh, which are the result of these uh, differences, that is what you show and seen here. So if we, for instance, take uh, 50,000 uh, SNPs, you see here 50,000 dots, uh, distributed uh, with the, the chromosomes here and the, the peaks that you see at these difference, these tell us that there is a, a difference in the DNA structure at this specific uh, chromosome 
and it is the difference between the affected group and the free group. And that tells us that, okay, there, there is uh, this difference and it might be associated with the disease that we are interested in. So in such a way, we can locate where, uh, on which chromosome the, the problem uh, is. And this is the, the approach that we also used to find the, uh, the genes that are involved or responsible for the um, uh, hydrocephalus and, and the dwarf uh, gene. So I'll <coughs> take you through this uh, approach based on this case control uh, uh, comparison of the DNA patterns, which is for the hydrocephalus and yeah, the, the Dutch word and then tra translated is waterhead. It is an uh, ex extreme uh, fluid um, collected in the, in the head between the shells of the, of the head of a foal and it is uh, clearly it's uh, lethal. So first, we, um, so we want to compare the, the DNA of uh, affected foals with uh, the, the control, the, the healthy uh, animals, and, and see where are the differences. So we used uh, 12 cases, which uh, foals that had, um, that, was, that, had, that died from, from uh, having this hydrocephalus. We extracted their DNA from blood, Hairs is also possible, and um, isolated the DNA and um, brought that on these uh, SNP arrays. And then we looked for okay, how does it look acro across these uh, uh, patterns? And here you see the result of it. So here you have these 31 chromosome pairs that you see here, and uh, you see a very clear peak here on chromosome 1. So that is indicating that the differences between the cases and control is on chromosome 1. So very likely there the gene uh, responsible for the, for the hydrocephalus is, uh, is there. And also we see <coughs> that there is not, nothing else, not, not very clearly on the peaks on the other uh, chromosomes. So that confirms that it indeed there is only one gene very likely responsible, and that is here on this specific location. So, and uh, above this line, so these are the markers that are significantly different between the cases and the control. And then we looked further into uh, it, so we aligned these, these uh, 96 uh, markers here on this chromosome 1, and that is the, uh, between the 60 mega base pairs, so that's 60 million base pairs, up till 90 million base pairs on this specific uh, chromosome 1. We looked in on, uh, on it, and because it is a um, recessive gene, and you see here, here you have these 13 cases, that is this, uh, it's hard to see, but that's here, and here we have the controls, and we know that the cases should be recessive. And that is indicated uh, for one of the alleles, and that is indicated with this red section. And the controls shouldn't be um, homozygous for that specific allele. So they might be heterozygous, or they should be homozygous for the other. And the other uh, allele, that is the, the green fractions over here. So you see here, uh, from 60 megabyte up till 75 over here, it indeed, these are homozygous for one of these alleles. But you see there are also red flags on, among the controls. So we knew it's not here, it should be uh, over here. So we looked further into it and we noticed and we, we start sequencing because remember these are only the markers and we looked at the DNA sections on the base pars in this uh, area and um, We, we focused in this area and there's still 140 genes that are in this uh, area and which one it is, we had to pick it out and we uh, looked at it uh, a little bit further using sequencing, so looking base pair, four base pair, etc. in six uh, cases and four controls and then we figured out that it is there is a mutation where we see that an, a C uh, base pair is 
uh, replaced by a T. So indeed, there is an error, a change of that, and that is causing this uh, particular um, disease of hydrocephalus. And the interesting thing, by the time that we uh, discovered this, and all this work is, by the way, also together with Utrecht University, in particular Peter Leegwater and, and Wim Bak, I told you before, we, we saw it is in this particular gene, B3 GONT2, and right at the time it was also found in humans that an error in this gene was causing some kind of, dis, uh, of hydrocephalus next to muscle dystrophy, but also hydrocephalus. So that was also confirming that we um, had, um, um, yeah, that, that, it, that this could be the responsible gene for, uh, for this uh, uh, disorder of hydrocephalus. Next to that, we also looked at uh, dwarfism, and it was along the same way, also a case control study taking 10 cases with, with a couple of controls. We looked at the very much the same way. We saw indeed also here that on chromosome 17, we uh, sorry, 14, we found this, this high peak indicating it's only one gene. And then we zoomed into this area. And again, we found a gene that is uh, responsible for that one. And the name of that is this B4GALT7 on, on chromosome 14. So that, that worked pretty nice. <clears throat> um, so we thought, well, we are ready for other diseases. And then we went up to, uh, to find uh, the responsible genes for the disorders of mega esophagus and aorta rupture. Again, a con case control study, about four, uh, 20 cases versus uh, so many controls. And this setting is uh, sufficient to, f uh, to find a uh, responsible gene in case of a monogenic recessive disorder like we are dealing with and we have shown that it worked for the dwarfism and the hydrocephalus. Okay, and then we got this uh, result. This is the result for the aorta rupture. So we hoped for a clear peak on one of the chromosomes indicating that it indeed is only one gene, monogenic, um, but we couldn't find it. There was no significant peak indicating, okay, this is the spot where we see a clearly a difference between the cases and the control. So where is the gene and is there indeed only one gene? So it was more complex for these type of disorders than what we saw on the uh, hydrocephalus and the uh, dwarf. And why is it? Well, there could be, uh, well, we had a couple of excuses maybe. First of all, dwarfism and, and hydrocephalus, that is already clear at birth. Then we see uh, this foal is suffering from these type of disorders. But how is it in case of um, megasophagus or aorta rupture? In particular, in aorta rupture, maybe the foal is healthy born and it is maybe at the at a much later age, that at certain certain uh, suddenly the, the the horse is is dying is is dropping dead in the in in the meadow, and well then without a very clear um, cause of that, just drop dead, and all those horses that are suffering from a weak aorta rupture, are they all dying? That's not very clear. So the, the, the diagnostics is much more complex than it is for um, uh, hydrocephalus and, and, and dwarfism. And the same goes for, for megasophagus. Some foals are suffering from that already at a young age, and they, they are, and maybe others are when they are older. So that is on one hand, how sure can we be about the cases, how clear it is that we are dealing with the cases. But also on the other hand, all horses that uh, grow very old uh, and, and first died at, at 30 years, maybe they were suffering also from uh, aorta rupture, but because they haven't been really under stress, haven't been used very heavily in sports, 
there was not really a pressure on their maybe weak uh, aorta uh, uh, so that there wasn't uh, any rupture. So the, the identification of what clearly is a case and what clearly is a control, and in particular also the last one, that is much more complicated in these type of uh, uh, disorders than it is with the others. <clears throat> and still, are we sure that it is monogenic, that there is only one gene responsible? We don't know. And, and what we see in other um, uh, species like, like dogs, uh, I've also seen that it is not uh, yet uh, identified or detected which, which gene it is. And it might also be that the same phenomenon, also if they are having a mega esophagus, um, it might be that there are multiple genes involved in it, and it is not their combined effect, but it is each of them separately are causing the, the disease. And if we don't know that, then it is very hard to find in this case control studies to find um, the, the responsible uh, genomics for that. So that is the, the current, that was basically the current states. And um, there is a new approach in that, and that is uh, uh, carried out by the uh, University of uh, Kentucky. Uh, and it is funded by the Fenway uh, Foundation. Um, and the, the man with the, the sweat on his back, that is, uh, the, is uh, Navid Yousefi. He is uh, analyzing uh, these, and it's under supervision of uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Graves and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ernst Bailey and uh, uh, Dr. Kalbfleisch. Um, so well known in the in the area of uh, uh, genomic studies on on horses, and the I, I will show you how this approach is. So this is different from what we uh, uh, saw in in uh, so far that it was a case control that we just have a couple of cases and we have a couple of controls and we compare their um, DNA on on based on the markers just on the markers that, that we did. And here you have a different approach. The, um, <coughs> we analyze, the, or we compare basically, we have an affected animal and we affect it directly to the uh, DNA patterns of their parents. Not on the markers, but the base, all the base pairs, all the, the full sequence, the, as it is called. And um, we know that for the disease, um, the, uh, the foal should be uh, homozygous for one of the, of the traits. And the parents, each of them, for that specific uh, base pair, they should be heterozygous. They are carriers because they were healthy, so they are not uh, affected by it. So it is a direct comparison. Where is the uh, foal homozygous? And where are the parents heterozygous? And it is a direct approach where, where it is. But still, it is under the assumption that the disease is monogenic, recessive. Otherwise, it's not, uh, it, it, work, it doesn't work like, like I showed you here. And the advantage of this way is that we uh, only uh, <coughs> require fewer animals. So we have what we call the, these family triplets, and we could uh, repeat this specific pattern in three or four of these uh, family triplets, like you see over here. And the advantage is that we um, have to, uh, that the, the, the diagnostics or the phenotyping of the affected foal, that should be really uh, accurately um, and since we only have a few of these uh, cases, uh, we, uh, and that is necessary, we don't have to include in the whole of the analysis cases that we are not sure about. And that is an uh, advantage for, for specifically for this type of, uh, of analysis. And we are not, also in this case, I, I told you uh, sometimes we were in doubt about control, and that is not uh, this approach is not suffering from, from such a uh, disadvantage. 
And again, it is a direct approach. So it's not on a, a markers, but direct on, on, the, on the DNA material. <clears throat> of course, it is also some disadvantages for each of the uh, animal that you are analyzing, you have millions of data points. So it's a huge uh, data analysis and uh, yeah, there is a cost in that uh, as well. And um, currently, uh, I, I asked uh, last week, uh, Navid, uh, well, what is the status? How far are you? And he, uh, he told me that uh, they have uh, sent off a couple of, uh, uh, of these family triplets. I think it was uh, four. And he just received back from the laboratory the, the sequence data. So he's now up at the status of going into this data analysis to figure out where are, yeah, are these uh, causative mutations to be found. So that is the status for um, Megasophagus right now. And uh, after that, if this is uh, successful, I think we, will, we can continue with uh, auto rupture. Uh, I must tell you, it, it was difficult to find good family triplets like you see here. Uh, these have been collected in, uh, in the US, um, but it took a while to, to find uh, sufficient numbers uh, of this one. But okay, we are there and hopefully it looks uh, promising. So that is the status that we have. Now suppose and, and uh, we have the DNA information and we can make DNA tests. What how should we approach that? How should we deal with it and, and implement it in our breeding work? And, and there are two approaches in that. First of all, the, the individual breeder. What can an individual breeder do? Well, suppose we have here the, the, the breeding stallions that are approved in the, in the stud book. And we know for a certain disease, we know if they are free of it or if they are a carrier. So the, the green fees, they are uh, free of it and the red crosses, these are carriers of it. So they are healthy all by themselves, but okay, the carriers, they might uh, transmit the bad allele to their uh, progeny. So if you have a mare yourself and you have tested it and you know that, okay, it is free for it, then you can use each of these stallions. There is no restriction in that. And you will always produce a healthy foal. But if you have uh, a mare that is carrier as well of this specific disease, like, like you see here, or you haven't tested it for, for, for some reason, then you cannot uh, choose uh, among all of the stallions, then you are, or you are at least advised to take those that are free of the disease themselves and not to, to uh, take one of the carriers as a mate to your uh, mare. So that is on level of the individual breeder. But what you should bear in mind you are uh, avoiding the so-called risk matings in this way, you should bear in mind that in this way you will not contribute to reduction of the bad alleles in the stud book. There is no selection against the bad alleles. So there's maybe some work for the stud book. They can, in, in their selection work, they can influence the, the frequency of the disorders in the population. But how to do that? Well, and then you should uh, bear in mind that uh, the frequency of carriers might be much higher than what you would expect of the frequency or the prevalence of the disorders. So suppose that the frequency of the disorders is about 5%, so 5% each, um, one in 20 foals is suffering from it. One of the foals born is suffering from it. How many carriers are there in the population? And that will be about 34%, so one in three. And that means also, if there is not a particular selection in the stallions, that one in three of the stallions is carrier of it. Well, it's not advised to select out so sharp on this on, on a particular disease, in particular not in, an, in an, uh, a population that 
already has some some um, inbreeding because you are creating what's called a genetic bottleneck and suppose that we have multiple disorders not only one but we have an additional so how many then it's it's hardly feasible to select for all of them such strong and it is not really necessary and it is not effective so the advice is to include it in the total breeding program so it is um, of, of course it gives it is an, a negative point but you should uh, Comp it, you should allow for a compensation in case of exceptional uh, horses with a very good contribution to the uh, population average. Then you should allow for those uh, stallions that they have this negative uh, allele in, uh, in there. So to summarize, <coughs> I showed you that um, the genetic disorders we are mainly uh, facing, they are uh, monogenic recessive because these type of uh, disorders, they have the possibility to disseminate throughout the population and to come back at, uh, uh, at certain frequency. And uh, the, the problem is the, the healthy carriers that, that cannot be identified without any genetic tests. So, but if we have this genetic test, then we can do a uh, proper selection against it. And uh, like I just mentioned, the prevalence, the prevalence of the disorder is much smaller than the frequency of the carriers. And I also showed you that uh, inbreeding that increases the risk of disorders. If we have related parents, then they very much, they have a higher uh, probability of having also bad alleles, the same bad alleles, and that will come into the, the fall. So it is clear that restriction of inbreeding that uh, still deserves uh, attention in, uh, in the breeding program. So that is clearly the, the function of a DNA test. Then we can make this distinction between carriers and healthy animals uh, free of the, the uh, alleles. Uh, we can use it as a uh, as breeder to avoid risk matings. Uh, but as an, uh, for the stud book, we uh, can also uh, use it to identify the stallions and, and all of its uh, all animals in the uh, stud book and select properly against it. And it is not advisable just to cull all of the uh, stallions because of this single uh, bad allele that they have. And with that, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention.